all about awareness and engaging the public as much as possible um, to get these messages across and, and to be able to deal with them. No, Thank you for that. Well, go ahead, Tom. Sorry, I was just going to say, there's uh, maybe like a slightly, to take a slightly wildly different look at this is a lot of the people who at this point are still climate skeptics, to some extent, are pretty entrenched in their views and are likely to often stay that way. And you'll be able to tell that pretty quickly. And I don't think the best way to deal with that is arguing them about climate change. I think they've probably decided that that's not real for whatever reason, obviously, don't particularly think they're right. But if you start on that, they're just going to then switch off and stop listening to you because you're suddenly preaching to uh, preaching to them and they don't want to listen. If instead, you can probably convince them to do the same things that someone who does believe in climate change would do. So Texas, for example, in the United States is what has one of the cleanest energy grids. It's got the biggest wind power sector. It's got I think third largest solar power sector. And that's not because all these Texas Republicans who publicly say climate <laughs> change is a hoax um, suddenly decide behind the corner that they do think that. It's because they believe other arguments that make them lead them to the same conclusions that clean power and renewable technologies are good for them. Um, I mean, it might be it's only 10 years ago you can remember when oil was 100 pounds a barrel. Maybe that could happen again. So potentially you want to safeguard yourself against price spikes in the future. It's also like you can talk about new jobs and new technology for people during an economic depression. You can also talk about foreign domination, how energy supplies today are controlled by a few countries like Saudi Arabia and Russia. And if we don't invest, if we're not the ones to invest in green technologies now, then China, for example, is investing in them. And we risk that the, in the future, all our energy industry would be dominated by China. So it may be the case that the approach is not to convince them that climate change is real, but to convince them to do the same things anyway through another means, and you're less likely to put them off like that. That's a really helpful perspective because the we might think that the aim is to get other people to think like us. Well, that's really beside the point. <laughs> you know, how people think is not going to be the main issue. It, it's we, we need to act differently. We need to yeah. design our systems differently. And I saw Martin doing this on his screen, which is about how do we incentivize the kind of practice that's going to lead to a, a, a better outcome structurally, personally, and so forth. So I'm curious, is if we do like a rapid fire loop through the four of you, if you were to think of one sort of climate change or, or climate myth that just needs to be busted and go away. If you could pick one of them to say, this is so unhelpful, let's just stop thinking like this. Um, what, what, would you, what would you go for? So who wants to go first? Oh, I'll, I'll go first then. Um, I guess the one which I come across most is the whole idea of the, the climate has always changed. Uh, and it has always changed, but as has been pointed out, it's changing very much faster now then it's changed for a very, very long time. I've actually done a little work on what's called paleoclimatology, previous climates. And yeah, we have seen rapid climate changes before. Uh, one which I worked on actually caused the, the collapse of the Akkadian Empire. <laughs> so when you get those kind of rapid climate changes, they're not necessarily good things for us. No, and is that the sort of stuff that Becky was referring to earlier in terms of like the tree rungs and the, the NASA data gives us not yeah, just yeah, a yeah. snapshot of yeah, right yeah. now, but we could see the, the, the stretch through time perspective. Yeah, I had a colleague who went off to uh, Arabian deserts and, and uh, analyzed the, we, we brought back these cores of, of dried up lake beds. Hmm. We analyzed those and you can tell an awful lot from the isotopes, from various bugs that are in there and you know you, you can tell a lot and work out what was actually happening at that time you could see these events you know one was called the 4.2k event 4,200 4, years ago and mm -hmm. you know, very rapid climate change but disastrous for the population mm -hmm. so that that's one myth that needs to go away well it's always changing so what's the difference yeah anybody else got one that you'd like to see go the way of yeah i think uh, that means that's a, 
always makes me smile is that uh, this will cost too much. Um, <laughs> I mean, how, how do we get people to, say, to get away from the thinking, this is not about cost, this is about investment. Um, and I like to use the, 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 the argument around opportunity. And I think Tom touched upon it as well. It's, it's, it's not doom and gloom. You know, this is a huge opportunity to, to change things and change things for the better. It will create a lot more jobs, you know, and particularly if they're taking it perhaps closer to home, you know, the post-COVID recovery. I mean, we, we are we're going to have to rebuild our economy and we need to re rebuild it better. Mm -hmm. It's a great opportunity to, you know, mm -hmm. rather than in, in investing in uh, the wrong sort of thing. We can start investing in the right sort of things, things that will create jobs, well-paid jobs, decent jobs, and that actually build a, 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 a much cleaner environment. So it's to me, it's yeah, let's get away from this myth that this costs money because it doesn't. The actually investment is good public investment. And you, you can take it from an ethical point of view or a political point of view or an economic point of view. You know, we borrow, um, we, 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 we borrow the our environment from, from our children and, you know, and we have to give it back to them in a, in a better state that we found than when, when we got it from our parents. And we can only do that by, with investment. We can only do that by making things better. Um, so that means this isn't anything to do with cost at all. And I'm, the economists, and I, I, my first degree was in, is in economics, but the economists have got it totally wrong, absolutely totally wrong. <laughs> And we need to persuade to show them that their, their, their attitudes of this is a cost are wrong. Um, but isn't it isn't it isn't it doubly wrong, Martin? Because not only is it an investment possibility, but we also can't afford not to. Literally, I mean, if you look at California right now, and you just you just look at the the the, the financial implications of the climate-induced natural disasters that we've seen in the last two years, the price tag on that to cities. Mm -hmm. states infrastructure roads hospitals need rebuilding homes that need rebuilding insurance companies it's astronomical so mm -hmm. to think that it's the cheaper option <laughs> going forward um yeah so i think you got both of those factors at once haven't you the slight myth is that we're trying to uh, disabuse economists of the idea that infinite growth in a finite world is possible now only mm. economists could believe that you know, I think we need a, a change. We cannot continue. We've got to stop growing in the way we, we are growing at the moment. And we've got to start measuring things properly as well. I mean, on a bigger scale, we've got to stop measuring things like GDP, which is a completely ridiculous way of measuring anything. It served its, tar its purpose in, in the 1930s to rebuild the economy then. But it's not the measure we should be using today. It should yes. be about well-being and, and how happiness and a whole host of other me measures. Hmm. Not but anyway, I go on. That's uh, fine. Becky, you were going to say something. I, I was. I was just going to sort of touch on that point that, you know, the economists so so far, I guess the economists, you know. Um, Sorry, are, apologies to any economists in the room, but you can <laughs> yeah. your, show your bit <laughs> in the comment section below. <laughs> <laughs> but we live in a very short-termist, capitalist um, way of living in the West, at least. And what is needed is going to net. So annoying. Okay. Sorry. You're okay, right. we're good. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, we need a, sh a shift in, in changing in looking at the economics. And I'm sure there is now more of a movement of natural economi uh, economists out there uh, where we need to start putting a value on the natural capital that we have in our natural environment, the services that we get. The, the water cleaning services, the flood storage services we have in our soils, the, um, the carbon sequestration you have in the soils, in your forests. Um, these are all, they have, they have monetary value. It's just, we need a way of, of, of applying that. And I'm sure there's a lot of work that's going on to kind of address that, to help kind of change the way we do business. Um, more work is needed. It's like a new science almost, isn't it? But we need that shift and change. Thinking on economics, because money makes the world go round. That, that is what we need to put value on our natural resources to in order to protect them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what's, a, what's a myth you'd like to get rid of, Tom? Oh, well, I mean, I can, I, I, I'll, I'll respond to the last ones and then I'll do my myths because they kind of link in. So I was doing, I'm also doing a part-time degree in economics at the LSE. And I literally had an exam two months ago where one of the questions was costing the cost of climate change in for a developed state. <laughs> and as saying how much, giving like 
financial values to the increased flooding each year mm. and like so it's definitely the discipline's changing and incorporating mm. <laughs> but um the myth i was going to do is i think that the one that i think is potentially dangerous is that this is a left-wing thing <laughs> um because ultimately half the population are not or more than or less than depending on where you are and the more that like activists on both sides try and associate it with one the more it means that half the time you're just going to do nothing on it whereas what you really want is continuous steady progress and everyone buying in and everyone agreeing that this is a common issue that all should um, move forwards on and I think there can be a tendency amongst activists often because they are um, do tend to skew left to use a lot of language and terms that can put off a lot of people who ultimately they do need to buy in and it's deciding whether, yeah, maybe sometimes you've got a point and you should, it's difficult to hold your tongue, but is it worth the risk of eight years of the next government not doing anything because they defy, decide it's not in their interests? Mm. Yeah, I think the, the myth that undergirds the kind of a tribalist perspective on this. Yeah. Um, when you see that playing out, don't you, um, in, in lots of different contexts, um, no, that, that's all very helpful. Uh, one of the things I've been reflecting on, because obviously the, the huge difference between Green Week this year, Green Week last year, um, is something none of us could have ever saw coming, which was a global health crisis. Um, and what struck me about the beginning of the crisis is that lots of people were, there was a, a famous line from Wuhan, which was a, a, a lady made a, a, a comment online, which went viral all around the world, which was, you know, what you can hear the birds in Wuhan something to that effect. So it's the first time that this city had sort of quieted enough, the traffic had slowed, the people were having a different rhythm and pace and you could experience nature in a way that you couldn't before. And, you know, we were noticing your know, transport had cut and industries were, were, were switched off. The whole global economy had been kind of switched off. And there was talk at the beginning, well, is this the a reset button? Are we giving mother earth a a, a breather we having kind of a sabbath of the land in this sort of language um is that going to help us recalibrate um and and yet as time has gone on we've it, it it doesn't feel that that's exactly what's really going on it doesn't feel like it's slowing or that it's given us the 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 sea change that perhaps we we thought that it might um I, i'm curious what you think um has pandemic this moment of switching everything off has it revealed anything to us about the crisis um uh, the, the environmental crisis is it showing us anything new about the situation and um or, or about our response to it um martin hudson do you have you again this is another area that you've written about so i'm curious to hear your take on this yeah well it's a complex one but when, when we actually, at the height of the pandemic uh, and at the height of the lockdowns, we actually lost about 25% of our carbon emissions. So in, in various cities like Wuhan, like the whole of China was 25% down, we went to about 25% down. But there was still 75% of our emissions happening, even though we'd closed almost everything. <laughs> so, you know, our energy people can comment on why that is the case, but it is, it is true. I mean, we'd, we'd lost a lot of our transport, of course, and particularly ground transport came to a halt. And so, yeah, we did have really big changes and, you know, people could hear the birds for the first time and so on. What's now happening, of course, is that things have bounced back fairly rapidly, uh, at least in terms of ground transport. Air transport is still way down um, globally, uh, but air transport only counts for, what, 2% of carbon emissions. So it's compared with ground transport, it's not big. But yeah, there was a time when we were talking about building back better. It's still a bit on the agenda. But, you know, there is, the economics is sort of starting to click in and people are saying, can we afford this build back better and, and whatever. It, it's a complex one. Uh, I, I think I've probably said enough now, you know, <laughs> my colleagues. 
it was we did have a, a very brief chat about this mm-hmm. um, in preparation for tonight, and uh, you did make a comment though about that, which I thought was so insightful, which was about um, about what it's taught us about our capacity for response. Yeah, um, well, I wonder if you want to say something about that. Yeah, that, that's the other thing, is that if you're looking at the climate change issue, governments are always saying we can't actually do it, it's too expensive and whatever. But this pandemic issue, they acted very rapidly and spent humongous amounts of money and closed all sorts of things down. So it does show that governments can, if they want to, do this sort of thing. So it is an, it, it, that, that and actually take action when they when they need to and when they when they think it's really important but at the moment they still don't think that climate change is a big enough issue to take those kind of actions so yeah. we'll go, to, we'll go to you becky real quick because you're yeah. kind of in in the thick of some of those conversations around what governments are going to be doing <laughs> about this um Obviously, in the States, you've got discussion around a kind of a Green New Deal, which, again, has been tribalized in the way that Tom is saying is quite unhelpful. Um, And uh, here, the prime minister has recently been talking about recovering, you know, in a kind of a green, in a green way. Mm -hmm. I mean, is you seen those moves as sufficient, helpful or or what what is your perspective? I would I would say they're all in the right direction, and that's the way we need to go. We need a green recovery, and th- this is the perfect moment for it. And we're hearing the right things from government. Um, I just hope we can keep them to it. Um, by the way, my views are my own. By the way, not of my, <laughs> my organisations as we're speaking. But um, yes, I mean there's certainly opportunities coming our way. So, for example, with the forthcoming environment bill. Um, there's provision to make um, biodiversity net gain mandatory, which means for developments, um, if a if developer comes along and wants to build some houses on this area of land, they have to ensure a minimum of 10% net gain for biodiversity, whether they can do it on their site. If they can't do it on their site, they have to seek somewhere else and create some habitat or restore some habitat off-site somewhere. And there's a lot of work that's going on into this, and it's kind of a new movement because what we're seeing at the moment, we've seen, you know, if you look at the State of Nature report in 2019, like that's published uh, last year, it shows the UK um, habitats and species that we're we're seeing is a very long-term decline, which isn't being stemmed by the measures we've, we've currently got in terms of our legislation, policy, our protected sites. So we do need a kind of shift in the way of thinking and getting people who were causing the impacts to pay for the and, and, and find solutions. So it's good that, um, you know, there could be more funding coming our way from government to help sort of um, plow into natural initiatives. Um, yeah, a new way in terms of planning, um, a new um, countryside stewardship um, kind of process um, to work with farmers to do more on, on their lands. Um, so hopefully things are heading in the right direction. Um, but yeah, it, it's certainly what we need, a green recovery. But I, I've, I've certainly got two um, issues I wanted to talk about briefly on the pandemic as well, which were quite pertinent, I thought. And it, it seems like there's two sides to the coin, because in terms of the pandemic, um, it's, it seems to have a common um, issue of what we saw with SARS, with um, the origins of HIV, Ebola, swine flu. It all appears to start with our contact with uh, the natural world, with wild species, and you have these viruses um, jumping between species and it's more likely to happen when you're kind of um, in uh, making inroads into natural habitats and, and you know wildlife trade and things like that so it really highlights the problems that we have in the way we're, we're currently treating nature almost disrespecting it and we, we need to change our ways to be more sustainable in the way we plan and very clear. Um, can you hear me okay? 
with you just wobbled, but now you're back. So. <laughs> we we heard what you one. said, so that's fine. And it's really a profound statement. So yeah, finish that off, thank you. Okay, and then the other side of the coin is more positive because it just shows during lockdown and um, the what Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust did a, um, a survey of their membership during the lockdown about how they kind of connected with nature during that time. Did it help? Hmm. So there's some very strong, of course, it's their membership. So already they're quite, um, in, you know, inclined towards uh, nature anyway. But the the stats that came from that were quite stark. So, you know, 97% agreed nature was important for relieving stress that they felt during that period. Um, 89% want to spend more time in nature than they did before. Um, 90, 98% agreed that the government need to do a green recovery in, in terms of how we rebuild. So it just really highlights our dependence on nature and our affiliation to it as well. So it's just very interesting to have those two sides of the coin, you know. <coughs> yeah, interesting. Well no, I think that's very insightful. And I, I'm sure if people put on their screens and were able to do thumbs up, don't, don't do that right now. But if you if you were doing that, I'm sure we'd have a, a, a almost a universal sense that people feel more connected to their, to, to our, particularly around here, where there is so much lovely space around, which we just take for granted so often. Um, we want to bring us uh, into land so we can create some space for a discussion um, with uh, with folks. So uh, our chat box has been quite quiet. So if you've got questions, uh, the best way to ask them is to fill the chat box up with your questions, then we can have the coffee break to, to compile those maybe into themes or whatever. So if anyone listening has got things you want to ask about or come back to, um, or things we haven't covered yet, um, you know, type away your questions, and then we'll, we'll talk about those in a couple of minutes. Uh, but um, I want to talk about take this away from the, the global big picture, a bit more to where you're about to take us, Becky, which is about what what do we begin to do? You know, uh, you, start, you talked about this, Martin, um, early, Martin Heath, early on, when you said that sense of, it's it, it, these questions often start as a they, right? You know, they will sort this and it will happen over there, um, somebody else. But uh, there's a, this invitation for us um, to, take ownership and say, okay, well, what, what, what can I do? What, how can I get involved? Um, so uh, yeah, I'd be interested to hear what you think a practical response begins to look like, either for you as an individual or your organizations and what you know, your, 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 your groups are, are, are trying to achieve. Um, some of that might be about policy stuff, some of that might be about technology, some of that might be about uh, industries. I'd be interested to hear. Um, so shall we... Uh, Tom, do you want to kick us off with this one? Just take a just a couple minutes each, and then we'll we'll we'll, we'll wrap up this this first. Sorry, half. Uh, my internet crashed for like a minute there. What was the main question? Sorry, oh, Tom. Well, I'll I'll go to someone else first. But my question was about taking this from the big picture down to the practical. Um, how do we uh, begin to make a difference in the sphere of influence that we've got? It might be our own behaviors. It might be our uh, our organizations that we're involved in so uh yeah so have have a pond on that we'll, we'll go to martin heath first and then we'll come back to you tom so we'll, we'll try to wrap wrap up in just a Sorry minute about that no 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 worries but we'll, we'll just have a, a brief comment from each of us and then we'll we'll bring it into land what do you think martin i think there's there's a lot all of us can do um in in, in certainly in behavior change uh, and, and the way we interact with others um, it's not that we need to do lots of little things because lots of little things add up into one little thing. Um, we've got to do lots of big things. Um, we've got to change the way we think and the way we act. And I know it sounds difficult, but we do have to change things like our diets. We, we do have to stop eating so much meat. We do have to stop consuming so much stuff. Um, we do need to start thinking about when we get in the car, do we really need to do that? Uh, we've got to start thinking about whether we, how we use our energy you know, what, and what sort of waste do we create. So these are quite big, quite issues, and they're not easy because I, you know, I, I've tried it, and it's gradually we've got to try it. But the other thing I think we we don't have to do all of this tomorrow. You know, fundamentally, we need to get to a zero carbon world by maybe 2030 will be good. 2050 is imperative, but if we get it by 2030, but that means if we were to cut our carbon just by 10% a year, 
for the next 10 years, we get to where we're going. So that doesn't mean we stop eating meat tomorrow, but it means we stop eating meat one day, one day every two weeks tomorrow. And then next year, maybe one day every two, two, one, two days every, every two weeks. It means we take, doesn't mean we stop driving tomorrow. It means that one, in, one, one, week, one day a week, one, one day a fortnight, we, we get the bus or we cycle or we don't go to work. Or, so again, we come back to the pandemic and how many people have cut their need to be in the office every day? Yeah, well, like I, big changes can happen now. We can use the technology differently, you know? So you're absolutely right, Martin. Well, the other thing I think we need to do is, is we need to, we do need to lobby our, our politicians much more uh, vigorously. Hmm. We do we do so today i mean so many so many local councillors tell me uh they react to their inbox hmm. so if they're getting lots of mails about dog mess and parking they'll do something about it but um, if they don't get lots of emails about climate change it won't be on the top of their agenda so we can do things individually uh, and, and i think we can do things collectively as well tom over to you you have a chance to to reflect yeah, I have. I mean, I, I'd second a lot of that. I, I do think there's sort of the little things that we can uh, do in our day to day day lives. That, I mean, often aren't little. They actually add up to quite a lot and quite measurable changes. That said, one of the things I think about climate change is that it's unusually for a problem of this scale. It is so dependent on like new technologies and things that come along because I'm not convinced that people are going to be able to change their lifestyles alone radically enough for things to, to change. And we've got a lot of technology that exists now that can do a lot of good work, particularly wind and solar. But I mean, even if we manage to decarbonize much of the electricity we have now when the sun shines, like ultimately we're really dependent on things like good fake meats that are cheaper than real ones so people start consuming them more we're dependent on long-term energy storage we're dependent on electric vehicles becoming much cheaper and these are perhaps less the things that we can do which i realized was the day-to-day -day practical but as was said mentioned earlier is like use your votes get out and be political write to your mps and suggest they put more money in r d like these are mm. the government can put money into startups um you vote if you've got savings use your um use your savings use your pensions put them into esg stocks and things like that and therefore provide funding through the market like these are things that um also will make quite a big difference it's like so much of this is dependent on technologies that don't even exist yet that what are going to be what enables these lifestyle changes becky um i'm going to comment further because you've done a lot of reflection on what does it mean for a local community to engage differently yeah, i have and again I, you know i would second as well what tom and martin were just saying um you know that we really can make a difference um, if we all change our behaviours and, you know, it is people power, it really is. I mean, you've got one end of the spectrum where governments need to be working together, imposing policy and binding targets, but as individuals, we need to change our demands um, as well. So absolutely, you know, it is things like switching your energy provider to a greener energy provider, um, you know, change your banking um, to a bank that invests in green initiatives rather than one that funds fossil fuel um, use um, or, or natural resources ex exploitation, driving less, flying less. These are things we can all do. And sometimes you might need to fly, for example, you know, you might have to, um, you know, like you might want to go back to America a few times, you know, see family or friends or whatever. But mm. So sometimes you do need to do these things, but there are there are ways you can offset your impact. So, for example, if you do take a flight, there's online calculators where you can easily calculate what your emissions were for that flight. And there are ways that you can offset that. For example, um, the UN Carbon Offset uh, Platform, um, it's just a website and it has a calculator where you can work out what your emissions are. And it just lists loads of projects going on around the world um, that are um, you can put your money in to um, offset your carbon. And um, I just had a little play with it as if I'd, you know, been on a flight. Um, you know, I chose a project 
I put in, and you know, I want to, I want to. Um, I've set three carbon units here and in the cart shopping cart it was like three dollars thirty-three. Mm. You know, it's mm. a silly example, but it just shows it's possible that you, you can do things as well as you know fly and things like that, although we do want to reduce fly. So things like that. Um, but yeah, of course, eating less meat and buy local and organic, you know, that's reducing the carbon footprint. When it's organic, there's less pesticides, there's less chemical use, so less fertilizers, chemicals, pesticides and things. Often organic food is higher in its nutrient content and its mineral content than the conventionally produced food. So if we're doing things like cutting our meats, we might be saving money that way because meat is expensive but that means well can we if we're eating less of it can we use that saving and buy the better stuff that's better for the environment and it's better for our health as well um you know fish um huge problems with overfishing and and depletions of our fish stocks it's a real real problem so if if people if, if we can all look for that marine stewardship council tick on on the fish products that we're buying we know it's guaranteed that fish is from sustainable stores and we all want to continue to eat fish our commercially important fish if it's unsustainable one day it won't be there anymore to eat so it's all in our interest to um maybe pay that bit extra but it's for for the greater good you know um and then little things you know what we can do if you're lucky enough to have a garden have a little wild corner in your garden allow the grass to grow don't clear everything away at the end of autumn like hollow dry and um, plant stems and things we you need that sort of thing for the bugs and things to kind of shelter in during the winter so less tidy but a bit more wild um holes and fences for hedgehogs and things we, you know we can all do our bit um a little bit you know to help the the natural um environment around us as well that's brilliant. Well, maybe, um, Becky, whether it's during the course of the Q&A or something, if you've got anywhere you can direct people where they might be able to find some, some, uh, some tips and some, some ideas, um, or if you have that another time, we could email it, we could circulate it at some point. But that's yes. all incredibly helpful. Um, I thought uh, we'd just round off with one last, um, just a question for Martin Hodson. I'll give you, give you the last word, Martin. Um, and uh, uh, perhaps others will may want to think about this in the next section if, uh, if, if, uh, if, if time allows. Um, but when you kind of set it all down at the end of the day, I mean, you've been working on this for a long time, yeah? Um, and you're just reflecting, sitting out on your porch or whatever, looking out on, on the, you know, a nice field or wherever it might be there. Um, what are the sort of things when you look to the future that either keep you up at night and you think, this was... <laughs> This is the thing we really need to get our heads around. Um, and in the midst of all that we've talked about, what in those moments also gives you gives you hope that we can make the difference and come around the corner? Yeah, I, I have to admit, I go up and down. I think a lot of environmentalists feel like that. You know, some mm. you think, oh yeah, We've got a bit of a solution. Maybe we can get our way out of this. And then you then you look at the news and you think, hmm, this doesn't look so hopeful after all. I think the things that keep me awake at night is just the worries about what's going to happen to uh, generations. You know, I, I think that really does worry me. As it happens, we didn't have children, uh, but I've got um, nephews and nieces. In fact, my nephews both got married in California in, the, in this last, last summer, uh, <laughs> and they both had humongous problems getting married, one, because of the pandemic, and two, because of all the forest fires and things mm -hmm. like that, um, and the smoke. Um, so yeah, I I really worry about what's happening to them and what's going, what their future is going to be, and what the future of their their children is going to be. I guess what gives me hope. I think the founder of JRI, um, John Ray Initiative, was a guy called Sir John Horton, who was actually the first chair of the 
Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And he was a very committed Christian. And he said there were several things that gave him hope. One was <clears throat> that the ability of scientists to solve these problems. And he, you know, he really did believe that science could actually help us get out of these problems. But he also believed, because he was a very committed Christian, he believed that God was in charge of this world and that it, that, you know, he wouldn't let it all fall apart. So, you know, that was, that was his belief. And, you know, he sadly died of COVID um, in April. Uh, and actually, the IPCC are going to dedicate the next report, which is due to come out next year, um, to him, mm. uh, the science, the, the, the physical science section of it. And so, yeah, and, uh, you know, he, he was a great, great man, I have to say. You know, you can, uh, look him up. I've put up the JRI website. If you look up Stephen Horton, you can see... You know, he was admired from around the world. Um, great man. That's me. Yeah, hope. <laughs> Lovely. Well, it just goes without saying that what an amazing session that's been, hearing from you all. Uh, we went a bit longer than I anticipated, but it was such a rich uh, conversation and so many good and, and, and powerful insights coming from all four of you. So... Um, just want to thank all of you for your your contributions uh, and for your your insights, but also for what you're doing in your own in your own contexts to push this forward and come make a difference. It's inspiring to hear your stories, um, and I think there'll be lots of connections that will be raising with people who are listening. So it's uh, about ten to nine, um, so we're going to take a five minute breather. Uh, we're going to finish off at about half past, um, and uh, so we'll just uh, let everyone grab a cup of tea. And then if you want to switch your cameras on at this point, um, if, if, if you want to, you don't have to. If you've gone into your onesie, you don't need to, uh, you can leave your camera off. Um, and then we'll come back and have a bit of Q&A. So feel free to keep filling your questions into the chat box. And then we'll, um, we'll, we'll put some of your questions to our panel in a couple of minutes. Thanks, Ben. Several questions uh, on the chat have uh, all centered around the question about renewables um, and about how we actually take that seriously, either for ourselves or for others. Um, so I wonder if we want to have a, a bit of a conversation around um, what's the best way we get off of the stop burning things train that Martin Heath was talking about. Um, and how do you do that for certain industries where just decarbonizing is really complicated? So anyone want to have a first stab at what our journey towards renewables might look like and where might the sticking point be? Where might the opportunities be? Well, I'm happy if no one else wants to have a go. Because yeah, you can kick us off, Martin. That's fine. Yeah, I mean, as we were sort of discussing earlier, the, we've got to do two things. Um, first of all, we've got to reduce the amount of energy we need, and that is all about energy efficiency. And part of that's to do with technology, part of that's to do with behaviour change. But we have to become far more efficient in the way we use energy. You know, for example, moving from an internal combustion engine to an electric vehicle or fuel cell in a um, vehicle could increase our efficiency by two or three, just, just, just by making those changes. So there's opportunities there to do that. We do need to start thinking, and I think Tom touched upon this, and how important storage is going to be in the modern world. Um, you know, renewables are great, but they're intermittent. So we are going to think about how do we store the, the energy when it's there. And you know, it's a little bit like what the ancient Egyptians used to do. They used to rain, they used to have a rainy season, and they used to store the rain for the dry season. Well, you know, we've got to do the same with energy. I mean, We've got to shift it by 12 hours. So when it's sunny, we've got to shift it into the night and we've got to shift it by six months. So when it's summer, we've got to shift it into the winter. And so storage is going to take a big part in that. So there are technological things we can we can certainly do to start doing something about, about energy. Um, so those are the sorts of things I think we might want to start thinking about in terms of renewables. 
we've got to start being much more efficient and we've got to make a lot more of the stuff or the energy we do need from renewables and we've got to learn how to store it much better way than we we, we do now so what do we take of the um the question about uh certain industries where that might be harder to become kind of uh, more energy efficient than others so there's obviously these electric cars might move things forward in that, that sort of space but something like a, like an airline industry or or are there other th- areas of our economy which are just hard to move off of a kind of carbon dependence or we just have to think completely different about which might not be on our radar so steel cement and concrete are the typical ones as well because mm. literally the chemistry of making those things requires you to have carbon and there's not really ways around that short of using much rarer materials um so when you're looking at industries like that we're either looking at entirely moving off of those materials onto different things which given like our urban future of high-rise buildings in a lot of the world seems quite unlikely because steel glass and concrete are the best things that we know of for that Um, so we're probably in those sorts of industries quite often looking at really either we're looking at offsetting elsewhere or we're looking at carbon capturing at location so when you manufacture the steel concrete having somewhere nearby a reservoir where you can bury the co2 that's given off um, is probably the best solution for those things obviously that very much is a case of you are spending more for the same thing for the um not luxury, but the necessity of burying the carbon. So you're going to have to make sure that other places around the world aren't trying to undercut you. Um, So if one country decides that it is going to bury all the carbon dioxide from the manufacture of those things and another isn't, you're gonna need to be careful about that sort of things. I saw also airline, another one as well as shipping, similarly, like long distance transport Mm. um, is gonna be difficult There's a couple options there. One is biodiesel, but then you run into the problems of land use, which I probably think is in many ways a a worse issue because like if we can't come back, if we lose habitats and species, um, there's a few options there. So one is maybe you do, um, again, carbon capture elsewhere, but instead use biomass and carbon capture. So burn burn wood and then bury the CO2 from that. And so you're net negative on that. And you can say that we're happy to take the little bit of emissions that comes from shipping and flying and then offset it elsewhere. Uh, Another would be that this is where you're getting into like new technologies we don't know know that much about. So hydrogen and ammonia. Uh, Hydrogen's got the problem of being gas and not super energy dense. Ammonia is very energy dense and would work, but unfortunately is what makes urine smell like urine. So how many people would want to fly in a plane running on it? I don't know. So there, there's lots of possibilities, but the big thing I've is- I've got toddlers. My plane always technology. always is like that anyway. So, you know, it's just everybody else in the flight. But No, that, that's really helpful, Tom. I mean, one of the questions that was linked to that is about how do you actually encourage companies organizations, governments to to begin to do that and to take that seriously. We, we talked about this a little bit earlier about incentivizing um, and, and such, but, uh, oh, sorry, Martin, you had your hand up earlier. Did you want to come in on something before we shift to that? Yeah, yeah, just, just briefly. The other mm. one is a real big problem <clears throat> uh, in terms of uh, carbon emissions is actually nitrogen fertilizers, uh, which we rely on hugely um, they reckon, you know, we probably two billion people on the planet wouldn't be here if we hadn't got nitrogen fertilizers, but we produce them through the Bourne Arbor process, which is highly energy intensive. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that is a really big one that is quite difficult for us to get off. Uh, now, of course, if you go for organic um, agriculture, uh, it gets around that, that particular problem, but then you've got you know, a lot, the evidence suggests that we can't feed as many people with organic agriculture because you lose more of it. But so you've got those kind of problems. But there is the yeah, nit- nitrogen fertilizers is one of the areas which is quite difficult for us to get off in terms of carbon emissions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, a sort of related question. Um, uh, 
uh, Penny uh, asks that should we sacrifice city centers, office blocks, costas, prets at the end of a long commute in order to work from home, save our high streets and local uh, cafes? So should we say goodbye to corporate copycatting and the long commute for local and investing and in, would that make much of a difference? Becky, got any thoughts on that one? You're on mute, so just need to. Sorry. So anyone who's anyone who's doing Zoom bingo, we've said you're on mute to somebody, so you can tick that box. So. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a difficult one, that one, because we've got to keep the economy going. We don't want the economy to crash, um, but we can't just. So we can't just stop everything, can we? It, it, it's been very nice, I have to say, for, for myself, not for everybody, but during lockdown to work from home because I'm saving an absolute fortune in not commuting. And it's good for the environment. It's good for, we've seen excellent um, effects on the local air quality while we've sort of um, gone through lockdown. And then, you know, that has positive um, effects for our health as well. But you know it's I think it's about striking a balance so I, I really hope that kind of most employers will adopt a sort of mixed approach to allowing people to be more flexible to sometimes come into the office but not every day we so we're not having that sort of micromanaging you must be in the office that so we see you're doing your work you know allow people to kind of improve their work-life balance by working from home some days of the week and then going into the so there'll probably you know be a change but I think that would be a beneficial change if we can kind of shift towards that better work-life balance thank you um so uh David Attenborough was uh, interviewed recently on the BBC and uh, uh, he was asked what we can do now to make some impact. And he said, don't waste, uh, which I think is similar to your comment, Martin, stop burning things, right? So don't don't waste. And you're, you're, you did make a comment earlier, uh, which is just a one liner, but an important one of, of the categories of things that are causing us problems. And one of those is about waste management. Um, and uh, so what do we think about that? notion of do we just need to find a better way of not yeah not burning things but also not 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 binning things um and specifically around things like like plastics you know certain kinds of technology that we have for storing food and keeping it you know like our stuff fresh and all the rest of it um so what do you think about this this advice of uh so david is it is it simple enough to just stop wasting as and what does that look like? Yeah, well, I think the first thing we've got to learn is there's no such thing as a way. You can't throw things away. You're just putting them somewhere else. So it's crazy to think we've thrown it away. We haven't just moved it. Um, and yeah, we do have to start wasting stuff. You know, we, we're an incredibly wasteful species. Um, we waste just almost everything we do and everything we touch. But in particular, in the borough of Basingstoke and Dean, and this really comes home, we, in, in our borough, we create more waste than almost every other borough. Not almost, yeah, we're in the top 10 for waste create. Mm. We're also in the bottom 10 for recycling. So in Basingstoke, we create more waste than almost everyone else and we recycle less of it. Now, why is that? Well, I don't know. Uh, it's a complex process, um, partially because we just accept that waste is okay in Basingstoke. We don't put pressure on our council to put in proper recycling. Um, we've gone down this route of we decided we're going to burn stuff. So we set light to all our waste in Basingstoke. And I do recommend if anyone ever gets the chance to go to the, the, the Chinam incinerator and look what actually happens to our waste. And if you can, you can see, if we had to explain to aliens how we create our energy, they would laugh. We actually set light to wet food in Chinam to try and create, burn it to create waste, not only wet food. But can you imagine how crazy it is? We, we, set light, we set light to wet to waste food um, and plastic and a whole host of other things to try and create energy. And we actually, we actually, we, we count that as renewables actually in, in our accounting system. So yeah, there's a lot we've got to do with waste. We, we've got to move away from being a, 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 a society that throws things away and we've got to move into something that's called a circular economy where we don't, we don't recycle, we, don't, we reduce what we use first. 
and then we reuse what we've got. And recycling is perhaps the third or fourth thing we should be doing. But it's hard. I know. I mean, I try to recycle, but I'm not very good at it. It's very difficult, particularly mm -hmm. so, where there are so many rules about what you can and can't recycle. And you come back to the business models as well. I mean, I just I, I did sales for a little while in my earlier years. And yeah. uh, a really valuable tool for companies is planned obsolescence. Hmm. You know, you design your projects intentionally with a shelf life so that you need to buy a new one. Um, it's one of the problems with our rapid spin on how our technology companies work as well is that you don't design a computer to last you for 10 years. You design it to last you a couple, you know, and, and on and on. And so our, 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 our marketing models, our commercial models, our design models are all built on chuck and get a new one. The whole economic system is built on this perpetual need to growth. Um, yeah, we have to do that, and we we need to change. We we need to start thinking about we we don't own things. We hire things. Mm. So you, know, you don't own a car. You you uh, you, you borrow a car. You you don't. You, and then the car continues to belong to the company that manufactures it, and they're responsible for the lifetime recover uh, operation of that car. I mean, more importantly, they're responsible for the the recycling or reuse of that car at the end of its cycle. So instead of incentivizing manufacturers. <laughs> Uh, building obsolescence we actually encourage them to build in long life and rely yeah. well this goes is a really important point it, and it's what you did martin earlier when you rubbed your fingers together it's how do you put financial profit margins on the right side of these 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 equations yeah martin go for it um yeah i i just finished reading um, a really good book which i think i would recommend to you and probably several of the panel already have read it um Donut Economics by Kate Rayworth. Uh, it's a brilliant book for looking at this whole economic situation. Why are we into GDP? Couldn't we replace GDP by something else? Why is the environment seen as an externality in terms of economics and so on? You know, so I think, you know, they, for, for a lot of people, I, I would highly recommend it. it. It's a little tough going in places, but I think, um, you know, if you want to get into the economics of the environment and how to actually, how we can actually move forward in this, I think it's a, a really good starting point. Thank you. Um, got a couple more questions here. While we're still in this sort of energy and big picture kind of, kind of economic questions. Some um, uh, pose the question about balancing our energy use with the demand from developing countries. Um, and this is quite a challenge. I remember there was a program um, that uh, was interviewing some of the leadership in India um, and talking about their modeling, what their economic needs are gonna look like and as, as people kind of uh, as the country advances its technology and its development, um, and it has a lot of coal. Um, and if they start using it in the way that other countries have in their industrialization process and so forth. So, how, yeah, how, how do we balance um, development and crisis? <laughs> um, and, you know, it's saying, well, it's all good for those who've, who've got the you know, the, the comfort and the means and, and, and basic amenities to think about cutting back. But yeah, Tom, go for it. So I think it probably means that for us in the developed world who can afford to make these changes and put the money behind it, it's all the reason for us to move fast mm -hmm. because the technology we have now is the things that when it comes to the end of its life in 15 years, we'll be selling to poorer places to start using our clothes, our cars, <coughs> our power sources, etc. So the quicker that we use it and the quicker that we make the changes that we need, the easier and the cheaper it becomes for everyone else. Like if we develop cheap solar electricity because we've invested lots of money into it, it then means that it's there for India to use when it's weighing up whether to open a new coal power station. 
Yeah, and I, I do think this is a you know it's a it's a tricky area, but we've got to understand that we've we've had our growth and we we built our growth and our economies on on you know, fossil fuels. And it's not so much how much is being produced now, but we also have to look at the historical emissions. You know, and people like the UK, Germany, mm. the US in particular have uh, we played, we've, we've emitted more than our fair share of greenhouse gases into the environment, and and we've got to take responsibility for that. Which means we have to act first. And as Tom was saying, you know, we've got the wherewithal to do that. We have the the, the resources to do that. So we have to take responsibility and decarbonize first. We can't expect that, that the Indians and the Chinese to do it. Although interestingly, even China has said by 2060, they want to get to net zero, uh, which is only 10 years behind us. Um, so yeah, we do have that. We, it's, out, it's down to us. No, we can't expect people in India to do this. And it goes back to that question. You can't expect they should do something about it. We can't say that they in China should do something about it or they in India should do something about it. It comes down to us. We should do something about it. Yeah, so that's not to say that it's because it's everyone's problem, everyone's still going to have to do something, even if it does feel perhaps unfair to people around the world. It's it's not that they've got their own things to balance and definitely carbon, climate change should still be on their minds. Mm -hmm. I guess this is where political leadership really, really matters right now, doesn't it? Um, and it's it's more than a tragedy. It's very quite potentially quite dangerous to have, say, the United States being the sole country abstaining from the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, and that sort of posture um, isn't exactly creating a climate that's encouraging other countries to be as proactive in their own in their own context. So um, Catherine uh, asked a question which is close to your heart, Becky, um, which was about biodiversity. Um, and she writes that biodiversity is sometimes secondary and of less importance to the neat and tidy uh, brigade. And it was so saddening to see our village greens and verges so abundantly filled with wildflowers and a real harm during lockdown, but mowed down as soon um, afterwards. So how do we best seek the behavior change needed, especially with those perhaps very local that find biodiversity management of land looking messy? Um, <laughs> That, that, that's a very practical way of putting it, but I think that's true. You know, we, we like a tidy garden, but what is the implications of that? Or even as I was walking to Winchester, very tidy landscape, perhaps yeah. too tidy. Very um, too so tidy. Absolutely, you're hitting the nail on the head, too tidy. And um, we're, we're getting less and less uh, wild natural places, which is where our wildlife are clinging on, you know. Um, it, it, it saddens me to see big massive intensive fields with no field margins um, to allow these, um, you know, we have it in many down actually in quite quite close by where they've got some interesting rare arable flora growing in those field margins. Um, there's still massive fields and we still have a, a massive problem with intensive farming, for example. But there are things that can be done to, to help reintegrate nature back into our landscapes. And um, it's all about working in partnership, you know, with landowners, with farmers, with engaging with the public, teaching children from an early age in school about the benefit, about nature, just like what is this flower? What is that animal? You know, we're losing a lot of that um, in our education, the kind of, um, you know, um, the, the natural vocabulary um, is diminishing, you know, in our younger generations. And it's a shame because if people um, aren't connecting with nature, um, we'll have less care for nature from society. So I just think it's really important to start very young <laughs> um, in the education system and, and really press the importance of nature and, and the benefits it brings and try and kind of move away from this kind of um, historic um, tendency to be neat and tidy, really. And um, I don't really know where that's come from, but it, it's been like that for a long time. And it saddens me to see people paving their front gardens for, for their cars, or for, for their many cars, and or, or use, use AstroTurf. It's really, um, you know, it just is so wrong um in, intrinsically to me because 
our soils are so important and we, we need to um, retain them where we can. Um, you know, and astroturfing your front garden means lack, lack of habitat for your, your hedgehogs and things that are foraging at night. And um, so a lot of our species are in trouble, but we can do certain things like we can retain a bit of neat and tidiness, but leave a little wild corner in your garden or, or a strip, you know, there's, there's little things you can do that will add up to, to, to a lot and allow these um, connections between natural places for wildlife to move through. There's plenty that we can do. Um, it's just about getting that message out, I think. It's interesting. I think we, when you fly in this over this country, you, you become immediately aware of how, uh, what's the right phrase? Not manicured, but how, uh, uh, domesticated the the, nat, the natural landscape has become um and uh and so yeah i think it is quite ingrained that you you manage it by containing it and by cleaning it up and, and all the rest of it and it, it is a big mind shift to say how do we design redesign into that yeah. um a sense of wildness and 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 yeah openness martin go for it yeah um actually a microcosm of it is the churchyard uh, because the, the, the number of battles over church, <laughs> you've got the guys who who really are biodiversity people who want wildflowers and want you know nature to thrive, and you've got the sort of pristine public mm. people who want everything mowed and not a weed in mm. and green thumb used everywhere. And it, you know, it's a, it's a microcosm of the problem, and and you know, it, some of the church council meetings that happen over this are horrendous. It's one of the biggest arguments in in many churches. What <laughs> about about the churchyard? Yeah. <laughs> Martin, are you waving your your pen? I think Becky, were you going to say something? And I, I I was just going to say, I'll be really quick, just to say that. You know, there are things we can do and nature will bounce back if you give it the chance. So it's all about doing doing a bit. Yeah. No, I was going to add, and Martin and Becky have probably far more expertise in this area than I, but I was reading something recently about, again, it goes back to diet, that something like two thirds of the land mass, the, the land area in the UK is effectively there for the production of meat or animal products either for grazing land or for growing the food to feed to grazing animals. So yeah, if we wanted, and I think we do need to start rewilding our, our, our environment and we need to grow more forests for several reasons, not just for biodiversity, but of course it, it sequesters huge amounts of carbon as well. But you know, those sorts of things, if we could rewild a third of the land mass of the UK because we, we reduced the amount of eat, the meat we eat, for instance, that could have a huge impact on uh, on, on, the, on, our, on our landscape and on our biodiversity. So all these things are sort of inter, interlinked, really. And I think there was another report, and I, I was trying to look for it, but I, it's something that looked at the, the biomass of humans and the human animals, the, the cattle, the goats, the sheep. And it was frightening, and I, I was a bit sceptical about the number, but apparently something like 80 to 90% of all the weight of land animals in the world are now either humans or the animals that we grow to eat. Mm -hmm. so is that I saw that. That, that, that was off David Attenborough's program. I was astounded by that fact. So just take yeah. the, the mass of animals left in the on the world on our land mass. Uh, on that are wild. The rest mm. is all most of it's cattle. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's mostly cattle. Or scary. We're coming towards the end of our time, but um there's, there's one other question embedded in in the in, in the list, which I thought would be an, an interesting one um, to to kind of round off on, because it's about what are the the engines for change. And we've talked about this a little bit, but I think this is kind of pushing a slightly different angle, um, which is what do you believe to be the importance of environmental activism in achieving change? Now, there's last year we had um, uh, 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 an activist from Extinction Rebellion as part of our um, panel. Um, and very much that perspective is, uh, I wonder, it would be interesting to hear a contrast between some of your comments, Tom, because quite a few times you, you've talked about how it's it's the technology that's coming 
um, that, that's going to make the difference. And I, I, we do hope that's true. Um, there's a sense in which the alarm bells are ringing loudly. And do we have time to wait for all of the future technologies to materialize? Or do we need to kick things into high gear right now? And I'm not saying you're not saying that, but um, uh, I wonder what, what is it going to take to wake up our, our, our political leadership? Um, is it going to take catastrophe or do we have any of the tools in our kit bag to say, let's get moving? I mean, it takes um, like society deciding what is and isn't acceptable and unacceptable. And that's a big part of activism. If the activists make it so to the general public, not doing anything on this issue and not doing a lot on this issue is something that's unacceptable for a government to do without it thinking that it's going to bleed millions of votes, then that's a really good thing. And then that, that can drive a lot of change. Like... When I'm talking about technology, it's for those tricky things. We have a lot we can do now with modern, like just natural gas, solar and wind, we can probably halve our emissions because the UK is now producing half the emissions we were in 1990. Mm -hmm. And the whole of the rest of the world can essentially get to the same point where we are now. So there's still like a lot of movement to be done everywhere just on what we have now. And I think keeping that pressure on, making sure that for like the youth of today coming up, who will then be sort of the majority tomorrow with the votes that like climate continues to be a top issue that everyone has to accept that they're going to have to work with is just extremely important. Hmm. I guess the thing is, is like, you've got to make sure your activism is smart so you're not pissing off as many as people as you're <laughs> bringing on side. Yeah, well, it's a fair point, isn't it? Um, any any other final comments on, on that from any of our other panelists? Yeah, I think activism comes in as a spectrum. You know, mm. the activism we can take as individuals ranges from chaining yourself to fences and trees, um, um, maybe super gluing yourself to things as well, which is right the way to just writing to your MP or changing your behaviour, voting with your feet, voting with your wallet. So activism is a, is a very wide range and a whole spectrum of things. And I, one of the one of the things that often keeps me going, I don't know if anyone's come across Margaret Mead, an anthropologist, um, and uh, a quote that often inspires me is, and she said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Mm. Indeed, that's the only thing that ever has. And and I think that's what it's going to take, uh, you know, a, a group of thoughtful, committed citizens to change the world. Uh, and that's us sitting around listening here tonight. You know, we are that group of citizens. And Hopefully there's, there's thousands of other groups around the country doing exactly the same thing. So I think we can do, we can, through our own activism, whether it's small things like writing to MPs and councillors or voting for the right, the right, the right parties, right the way up to doing you know, non-violent direct action. It depends on individual choice. But you know, all of those things I think are valid. Well, I can't think of a of a better way to round off our evening. Than what you've just said, Martin. I think that's that's so helpful and so so apt. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you uh, to you for um, it's been a fabulous conversation um, and for engaging so thoroughly and and uh, with such experience and insight into these questions. Um, so, uh, uh, on behalf of everyone who's here, I'm really grateful to have had this chance to talk. Um, and uh, if any of you have got things that you think would be fun for people to follow up with, whether it was recommendations, some of you've already put some things in the in the comments uh, area. Um, but if you you know wake up tomorrow morning and think, ah, what I really should have shared with everyone is they got to go and read this or watch that, then uh, let me know. We could circulate that around to, to folk. Um, I, I just wanted to close um, with a, a couple of final final remarks. Um, one is just to encourage everyone. Uh, this is Green Week just getting started. So if this is a good evening, there's much more to come. Uh, so do uh, have a look at the program. Um, go to the church's website, www.oakleywithwooten.org.uk. And right there on the homepage, we kind of dedicated the whole thing this week towards Green Week. So you can find uh, the booklet and the, the program there. So register for any event that you like. Love to see you there. Um, and uh, the, uh, the second thing was um, 
if you're trying to get your head around, you know, what does this all really mean for my life? You know, we talk about these global, big, massive issues, and it's quite difficult to conceive um, at times. It can feel quite abstract. Uh, literally just this morning, I, I was helping to paint our kitchen um, and I was listening to uh, a program which is from the New York Times, The Daily, which is one of their news, news uh, podcasts. Um, and there was a program on climate migration. You know, what's it going to mean if we climate change forces people to leave their current environments and have to go somewhere else? We often think of that as a question for the developing world. But actually, this was raising the question of what's that going to mean for a country like the United States? Um, and this is very poignant now as I look at my home state. Many parts are becoming uninhabitable right before our eyes. What's that going to mean for our economies and everything else? So I'm just popping into the comment box a, a link um, to that story. It, it, it's sobering, but it does help us understand kind of what's at stake for ordinary life and why we do need to take um, this seriously. And the last thing I wanted to do to, to close this out tonight is, is just read us a quote from a, a, a wonderful uh, environmental activist, um, a, a Christian, a theologian, a poet, um, and someone who's inspired a whole generation uh, to take seriously um, good care of, of this wonderful world that we live in. A chap named Wendell Berry. Mm -hmm. And uh, Wendell uh, has this to say in his, his book, The Long-Legged House. He says, we have lived our lives by the assumption that what is good for us will be good for the world. We have been wrong. We must change our lives so that it will be possible to live by the contrary assumption that what is good for the world will be good for us. And that requires that we make the effort to know the world and learn what is good for it. So I think that for me is a, is a resounding challenge from tonight's conversation. What does it mean for us to know the world, to appreciate it on its own terms, to learn what is good for it? And by serving that, we serve the common good of our, of our common humanity. Well, many blessings to all of you. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. And we look forward to seeing you throughout Green Week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone.